everybody, it's Katie, and in this video, I interview a woman named Laura. She went on the Sinclair Method for her problematic drinking about six years ago, and in this interview, we're gonna talk all about her experience with the Sinclair Method and naltrexone and achieving extinction, and also what her drinking was like before she got on the Sinclair Method and what it's like today. I really loved this interview because Laura was so just genuine and honest and authentic, and it was really awesome to have a chance to speak with her. So I hope you enjoy this interview. So Laura, can you tell everybody, um, when was it that you started on the Sinclair Method to address your problematic drinking? Uh, well, it was about uh, a good seven years after I'd fallen across the line of alcohol alcohol abuse. Um, it was in 2014, I'd say. Sometime in 2014. I don't remember what season it was, but it was sometime, probably then. So it's been, I'm, I'm on six years. I've passed six years. Uh, I'll be, and I'm hitting seven years next, so. Well, it's amazing. I'm excited. That, that makes me happy. So you're like one of the longer people I've talked with about the Sinclair Method who has been on it the longest or, or who started it the longest time ago, I should say. So um, what was it like the first time you drank on the naltrexone medication or even the first couple of times? Every time it was the same for me. Um, the side effects I always felt was a little bit of nausea and depression. It's, it's like it makes you just a little down, you know, just blocking all those pleasure receptors. And so, um, but from the very beginning, I always looked at it as a chore that I didn't want to do because I, this may, new things have come out. The, the drinking log, that wasn't like so prevalent back then. I, I didn't keep a log or anything. I would just go get a bottle from the liquor store and go home and say, okay, I got to take this damn pill. And then I got to force myself to drink this bottle. And then that's the way it felt. It felt from the very beginning that I had to force myself. But the way it really it felt, um, interestingly enough for me, is that I, uh, I had two glasses of wine. That was my, on this particular, on the first time, I poured myself a glass of wine. And I, I poured, I was going to drink two. And I could not drink two glasses because for some reason, when I take that naltrexone, I don't want it, period. I just don't, it just doesn't feel good. And when I, I just start feeling worse and worse. And, and, and ironically, I had a big insomnia issue recently and I tried to, uh, I actually tried to use alcohol to get me to sleep a little bit yesterday. Just yesterday, I had a, I said, okay, I'm gonna open up the bottle because I've only got like a million, you know, laying around everywhere. And uh, I said, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this because I, I hadn't slept in two days. I have really bad stuff on sleep insomnia. And, uh, it didn't do anything but make me dizzy. I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a lightweight now. It was like after two steps, I'm like, okay. But it made me dizzy. I just felt all yucky. I never even got my nap in. So it just, I never get that reward ever anymore, um, regardless. Of, but regardless if I uh, take the naltrexone or not. Uh, I just remember just, just, I could not finish the second drink. And well, I was so eager. I was so eager to, uh, you know, reprogram my brain and be a normal person that, you know, I was going to do this every single night if I had to, is just take that pill or every single day. Cause I didn't know I wasn't working for like 10 years. Um, I just would just plan that time. Um, but make no mistake. I had lost every single, every single thing I'd ever had. Alcohol did take it all away, but, but it was nice that it gave me a little bit of a bone with the issues of the Sinclair method because then I joined the company that sold alcohol. Um, that, that, that is just so funny, but it's always felt like a chore. I did it. I was an instant responder. Claudia says she's an instant responder. Um, when I met her, it was, uh, it, it was like meeting somebody who, well, you know how you, you know how it is when you meet somebody who's got the same thing. It's just like your kindred soul. So yeah, it was good like that. But uh, she was, she was somewhat of an instant responder too. And so I don't, I don't even remember. I thought finally it got to the point where I didn't think I could possibly be extinct because I thought it was going to have to take a really long time. But I just knew I couldn't do it anymore. So I want to back up a little bit because I know you said something which you and I have talked about and where your Sinclair Method experience and opinion is different than mine, but I still want to share it because it's, it's true for you. And you mentioned that 
you know, whether you take naltrexone or, or not, you do not like alcohol. So can you share with people a bit, like I know you started the Sinclair Method almost seven years ago, but it sounds like you're drinking a little bit still today here and there, but are you still taking naltrexone when you drink? No, I've never, I haven't taken naltrexone probably for four years. Wow. And so what's that like for you? Because you will talk about your extinction in a little bit, but like you, you still drink, but without the naltrexone and you still, you don't have those habits or tendencies you did before. You know, I just told you I had a little bit of wine yesterday, but literally that's probably the second time this year I've tried to drink. Wow. I when I started working here the very first week, they had a tequila tasting. I'm like, Okay, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you work at an alcohol distributor, right? Or a wine? No, we, we have two really nice restaurants. One's in Santa Monica, one's in Beverly Hills. But we, but our main business is uh, selling fine and rare alcohol wine, and uh, and so right here in Culver City, I'm sitting on fifteen million dollars worth of alcohol that I don't want. Can you even believe that? It's like it's a joke. <laughs> you know, the way it used to be the center of my life. You know, it's like a like. I even got some whiskey at like over there, like a five hundred dollar bottle of whiskey. I just don't want it. I don't. Wow. I don't want any of it. It's just I just lost my taste for it, and and it it surprises me so much. I mean, I could have a sip of red wine or something and say that tastes good with a steak. That does taste good. It does taste good. Um, but no, I just it's just more than just a little tiny taste, and I'm not interested. I'm just not. So that's what it did for me. But I. I think that that's in conjunction though, with other things that I did. Yeah, let's let's talk about that because you know it's my, my opinion on that is like I haven't drank in two years, but if I were ever to drink again, you better believe I would take naltrexone before because I just don't trust myself. But I know, like when I talked to you and you shared a little bit about what else you or what other things you did that have helped you really change that core relationship to alcohol. So can you talk a little bit about, in addition to the pill, what else helped you? Sure. And you know, I'll tell you one thing. If you uh, if you just take a pill and address the physical side, um, that's not the that's not the way you got to to where you are. And so it's it's not addressing the, the things that need to come out with the kind of a therapy, like a, a deep cleansing almost. And for me, it you know, I was introduced to AA when I first went to rehab back in two thousand and seven or something. I think that's when I went. And uh, yeah. And, um, you know, I had to go, but I, I, not, I, I had issues with it. I always, I always felt something negative about it. Um, and what I knew deep in my heart that I wasn't going to be able to uh, do what they, they say you need to do. I just, I just knew I couldn't do it. I, uh, I don't know. I, something, just something, a gut feeling. I, I knew it wasn't going to stop me. And I, at the end, I, I think I told you, I was, I'd finally gotten to the point where I had to be just as rigorously honest with myself that I was going to die from this disease because I could not stop. Um, and I couldn't even see myself ever stopping. Uh, and so I just, uh, I did, I did it. it they say in AA, I'm, I'm a rule breaker. So my sponsor wasn't a female, it was a male. And uh, they're like, you know, now you're really doomed for, um, you know, failure, Laura. But no, this gentleman, it was a, uh, a teacher. And um, he really took me on a journey through self-discovery. And all the crap and all the issues that I've gathered my entire life, and there's many decades of that now, um, you know, had never been resolved and had never been, uh, understood. And so I was always using alcohol just because I wanted to escape, to escape, cope, to cope, you know. And if I hadn't have had that therapy, I wouldn't have stopped. Nothing would have changed. I would be dead probably. Uh, wow. Wow. Because it did, it, it, that did the mental part. The mental part's much more difficult, mental, emotional part. And then, uh, you know, the, the Sinclair method surely did the physical part so well for me it just took away all those cravings you know i know i know you know what it feels like to just sit there and just all you want i mean you'll give anything just for a glass of something you know <laughs> yep <laughs> and, and uh, but, but you know if you have the physical part that says you know your body isn't asking for it it's just your mind asking for it and your, your mind is a lot stronger than uh your body in my in my opinion because it'll get you it'll get you straight to the liquor store and and, and where you need to be drinking every day. 
So I remember you saying that like, it was kind of like years of cognitive behavioral therapy and just work you did on yourself to kind of resolve stuff. So you feel like that was like- I think I could have done it with a therapist as well. Yeah. I did it. I mean, I did it with a, a sponsor. I, uh, and I went to AA meetings. Now I hate going to AA meetings, but I would, I'd have to go cause I'd have to meet him there. And so I'd go, if not daily, most days. And just he, I think just hearing it and just hearing it, I would never really talk about what I was doing because everybody's going to tell me I was wrong and I was wrong, 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 wrong. And so, but I never took a chip. I never took a dirt. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't, I never had, I, I don't, I couldn't even tell you what I thought my sobriety date was, you know, as far as the last time I had a, I don't even remember the last time I had a drunk or how it was, but I never caught a date anyway. And every, every time my sponsor would get a chip, so I've got like five years worth of his chips, you know, um, I don't go to, I don't go, I haven't been to AA since uh, I started this job and that was a year ago this month. Okay. So let's go back Long a little time. bit to, back to your Sinclair method experience a little bit. Um, I, tell, I know you were a fast responder, which is kind of rare for a lot of people, but I want to hear more about your experience on the method and how quickly it took you to reach extinction. Uh, I was trying to figure that out because I, it felt like I was extinct you know, practically before I began how much I loathed alcohol just instantly. But I would say I did it for a good six months and then I gave up. I said, you know what, if my brain's not reprogrammed at this point, then it's never going to be because I can't, I can't force myself to drink anymore. And I really, that's what I was going for. I was going for that normal, that normalcy, you know, because you know, I had, I had understood that's what it does. If you drink on um, naltrexone, it's going to reprogram yourself back to where you were over on the other side of the line. But it was always such a chore. And then, you know, take, I love to go gambling. Can't, and it does the same thing with that. So, I mean, so I'm sitting at the casino. I'm loathing my gambling session. And I don't, I'm loathing the drink I have. Oh, my gosh. Not a good time. <laughs> so you have experience with gambling on naltrexone and it worked to block that as well? It does. It does. It works on, it works on opiates, gambling, and alcohol, you know. Wow. That's Claudia told me those three things, but um, yeah, it was like, this is my, I'm supposed to be having fun here and I'm just pissed. You know, <laughs> but, but I did notice, uh, and it was probably um, late last year, I had a martini at a rest, one of our restaurants here. And, uh, and that was the first time since I'd not been drinking, like, uh, that I that I actually felt it. I mean, I felt it. I mean, I had half of a martini, martini and I was just, oh, yeah. I'm not much worse than I am right now. Just going off. I could just tell I was kind of getting a little tipsy. It's like, oh my God, you're not used to drink. I couldn't get, you know, you can't get drunk. <laughs> you, you end up passing yourself out before you feel anything different. So it was, I didn't like the feeling either. So it really, I mean, it worked effectively for me. And I, I never did any splitting with the dosages or anything like that. I think is it 50 that you go on? Or yeah, 50. Yeah, 50. Uh, I had the little fob, and I listened to my sponsor, and I had it on my keychain. He's like, and he was, I had to tell him because, I mean, I'm trying. He's the one person who's going to save my life, right? So I didn't tell him for like two years. I wouldn't tell him for like two years. I just, it was the one secret I was holding from him. But I told him. But he knew I had a, I had a fob full of pills, and I had them on my keychain. He's like, does, every time you look at that, does that, doesn't that say you can drink more? I was like, yeah, it kind of does, you know, so I don't keep it on your keychain, put it somewhere else, you know, I mean, you know, he had good suggestions to go along with it. He was a one chip wonder though, you know, and I couldn't relate to that. He's like been sober 17, 18 years. Wow. Just walked in the rooms and never walked out like, whatever. I was a chronic relapser. I mean, I just, I just, I was, I was, I was going to the liquor store on the way home from AA meetings. You know? <laughs> Can you tell us then, like, paint a picture for your, what your alcohol use disorder was like before the Sinclair method? Like, I know you said you lost everything. So what was that like? Well, it's very dire, actually. I was, uh, so it was, in my job, I had a, it was kind of a sales component. I had clients and I'd go out and smooth them a lot. And, and, and uh, I just started drinking regularly a lot. I, you know, just started to be part of my normal two-buck check. I don't know if you were uh, you know, it was back in that era, and I would just, I just started, the drinking started to increase, and um, it, then the daily, it became a daily thing, and then 
uh, the depression started to come in because it, it is a depression. Uh, anyway, I think uh, somewhere along the line, if I was doing it every day, you know, your, your body is going to get addicted. Whether you, I mean, I, I wasn't really paying attention. I wasn't worried about that. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a lot of, uh, you know, sales. Like you, you drink a lot, you go party a lot, you go to all these little sales functions and you go to one. Uh, and they just a lot of alcohol all the time. And so I, I didn't, I just started to just withdraw. I think, I think I just really pulled into myself because suddenly the only thing that was important to me was sleeping, just knocking myself out and just not being around. But I, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was around the same, same time, 2008. So I had, uh, gotten laid off. I got laid off. Well, then back up a second. I had, I, I had gotten, I was very depressed. I remember I lived in Costa Mesa. I'd, I'd taken a leave at nine weeks off work just to see if I could pull myself together. But I wasn't admitting to anyone that I had alcoholism at that time. And it, it does run in my family. I had the gene, my father, uh, my grandmother. And then also, you know, so I knew. So, but I wasn't telling anybody because I thought I could just stop. I thought, it, I, you know, and I did all the things that everybody else does. You switch brands, you... You just create all these rules and none of it ever works. But, uh, and, but I thought, of course, I was smarter. And at that time, I was doing a lot of other drugs, too. I was doing a lot of uh, anything. I was just doing anything. It was uh, crazy. I, if you can get addicted to it, I can get addicted to it. Um, and so it was just that whole mess. And then, you know, my sister came out and, and she's trying. They don't know what's wrong with my, my dad thinks I'm losing my mind. He thinks that he's going to have to put me into a psych for the rest of my life because I'm not telling anybody that I'm drinking like the way I am. And I am drinking. That I am drinking. That is all I'm doing is drinking. And uh, so he came, he flew out and I finally just got the courage to say, Dad, I think I have a problem with alcohol and I threw myself into rehab. And that really felt good at first because everybody is there and you realize that there are other people just like you and you, you feel like you're, you're where you're supposed to be. But it, it didn't take take, but it was a good thing for me to do. It was me and like tw 12, 12 or 13 guys at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach. That was it. That was my rehab. It was the best. It was a blast. I had the best time. <laughs> good little vacation. It was <laughs> fun. But what happened, you know, I, I got out and I had all these new things that I could do. And I was, you know, I, I had, a, like I told you, I married somebody out of rehab, 19 years younger, after I quit, move cross country, get married, lose, you know, all the things you're not supposed to um but it's uh it, it was it was more, it was fun and it was good because it got me out of the I was in a deep depression I thought but I, I couldn't see I felt like the dark hole no way out and I, I couldn't feel any joy and so I was just uh and I, I had and I was dumb I was financially dumb I had a lot of money in real estate I had money in um you know pensions and formal k's and all of that stuff was gone with the 2008 bust, about a little bit over a million. And that was depressing too. I knew I could never recover from that. I knew I could never, ever, you know, get that back. And I also, you know, as the years went on, I had, I started to lose hope that I'd ever get back into the workforce period because I've been out of it for so long. But, it, but that time that I was out of it, so I, you know, I moved and then, you know, you stay, I got a, a different job, you know, then, start having issues and the only coping mechanism I really know is alcohol and so was my husband too so you know I kept going back and forth up and down kept relapsing pretty hard and uh, other things were still recreationally okay and I just uh just kept just existing just didn't bother to try to change it I had accepted that you know it was as good as it was going to get until it got really bad again until it got until I lost the, that job too and then I, you know my husband relapsed. He went, he went that way and he went to rehab like for three months. And that, that's when we decided to, that's when we decided to divorce. And so he's off doing that. And I'm just, I lost my job and I had, I'm, an, I'm alone in North Carolina. And I just started drinking again really hard again. And my sister, I was living at my sister's house on, like in, the, in this little back house. And it was like, there was no restroom or kitchen or anything out there. And it was freezing. It was in Ohio. But, uh, you know, I would, that's why I was just living. I just, I, she'd go to work in the morning and then I'd go to the liquor store and, uh, and I just drink until I passed out. And that's all I did 
for the two years I lived there. She threw me in the back of my car and drove me down to my dad's, down the east, down the east coast, down to my dad's. And uh, I had to stay there for my dad's career military. He was retired, you know, he was a chief. I stayed there for like two months, you know, and I just, there was just no way I could even, I, I couldn't get the alcohol, or I would have. I mean, I tried at first, he caught me, I did, I was sneaking out of it, but uh, eventually I couldn't sneak it, he busted me, and uh, I just had to play by his rules, and I got better, and then I decided, I hated Ohio, so I was going to move back to California, and I moved back here, and, you know, I was feeling pretty good, but then I got here, to be my mother's caregiver, and then all the old behaviors came right back to where all I was doing was basically the same thing. It was just every day was just when can I get the bottle and when can I drink it and get that blessed relief of just knocking me out. I was always a binge drinker. And the whole career of the alcoholism. I, mean, I was never social. I wasn't. Although I did go on like I'd have I'd have a customer calls. I'd drive to downtown L.A. and I would go and conduct. A meeting and have no recollection of it. I was a blackout drunk. Whoa. I know. Whoa. I know. But I don't, so I don't know that. I mean, my car, I, I didn't hurt my car, but I don't know what I did in those things. I don't, I went and I took my manager, I'll never forget this, one of the most mortifying experience of my life. I, I took him out on a call with me and I thought it was my first call, but I'd been there two weeks ago. Uh, oh my gosh. No, I didn't. Yeah, I just totally lost my mind. I mean, I had no idea anything. And um, so it was miserable. It was just, a, you know, it was just a miserable, miserable life. And, and I, once I think that, 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 you know, you said that you can dwell on everything you lost, that, that would still make me bitter today. But I can't, I try not to even think about it because it, it's not something that I can do anything about. So why sit there and just relive the experience of what, all the bad decisions I made that made me lose and everything I'd ever worked hard for. And then just took me down a, a road of, uh, you know, debauchery and just uh, addiction, just just wanting that fix and nothing else was important ever. Your story is so inspiring and interesting because you have had so many rock bottoms, it sounds like, and really severe alcoholism. And like, you've come back and you bounce back with the Sinclair method in like record time. And it's really inspiring because I sometimes hear people say, oh, I'm too far gone. This method wouldn't help me. But like your story is proof that that is absolutely not true. It's not like you have to just be a you know, moderate drinker for this to help. It's like it really amazing how quickly you responded. It, it kills me. It's, it's, uh, it was so fast and I'm so grateful, but I'm also a little bitter. It's like, why couldn't I have found this in 2008? <laughs> As a matter of fact, ironically, they did prescribe naltrexone for me when I was in rehab in 2007, they prescribed it for me on a daily use to uh, curb the cravings. I'm sure it does that too, but I, I, uh, I don't think I was ever really interested in curbing uh, the cravings until I absolutely had nothing left but death. I mean, <laughs> my mother was going to call the, what is, what's that number you call here? 311 for the people, just, you know, they're, they're just, that's it. There's nothing left. They don't, nothing. I had nothing. Wow. Um, I don't know how I, I, I just somehow found the way to pull out of that. And I, I, I don't know that if it had been any harder than the way it was, if I'd have done it. <laughs> I was pretty, I was a pretty beat up person at that point, but no, it did, it did the physical part for me really well. And, um, if you can't get the, if you don't get the, if you don't get any sort of high out of pleasure, out of drinking, you're going to stop, you're going to, but it wasn't, oh, I didn't get any pleasure out of it. It's like I really just loathed the way I felt drinking naltrexone and the alcohol. But I guess I did it enough to where, you know, everybody says, be compliant, be compliant, be compliant. But I swear to God, I can just think about naltrexone and it just makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just, it, it just dulled everything. It just yeah. dulled any type of reward uh, uh, receptors that I had. And so it's kind of like, you know, you just, have those theory, you just don't want it. You, yeah. I said, no, I don't want it, you know? And, and, and I, I, can tell, I think I told you I waited five years before I told anybody because I didn't trust myself to see that I could actually do it. But I, I think it's almost like I feel like sometimes I feel like I went a little too far because I really would like to really enjoy one, a glass of alcohol, you know? <laughs> but I can't even quite get there. Yeah, you went the extreme the other way. It made me hate it that I get a job at a wine 
I mean, I think that's like part of the what what how the naltrexone works is like for me, like I'm not as deterred as you are from alcohol, but if um sometimes I would drink on the naltrexone and just it would disgust me so much that I'd go a really long time without it. And so that kind of is how it works. Um and I hate waiting like that it. hour because it's like, oh, I gotta drink. Oh, I gotta wait an hour. <laughs> yeah, it becomes like a trouble. You're like, that's oh, not worth it. It really is. It just gotta be so much better. And then, you know, sometimes like, oh, half hour, good enough, you know, because it wouldn't work. But did, I mean, did, did you, what do you do for the mental side? What have you done? Have you done therapy? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's something I want to ask you about too, because I, like, I think I've, um, I've done a lot of therapy and just kind of work on developing myself and honestly, like, growing in a relationship with God more recently, which has been kind of different and deepening and really amazing as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you because, you know, drinking was such a big part of your life. How did you, like when you started to despise alcohol, how did you fill your time with other things? Like, was that a hard transition period or what was that like? Uh, you know, I'm probably always, uh, you know, always, start, that was one other thing that I had no interest of is that, you know, we can't have anything that's mind altering. It's like, of course we want mind altering things. Uh, I don't know. I was so busy with, you know, it wasn't normal therapy where you go once a week or, you know, once a month or something, you know, I was going to these AA meetings practically on a daily and that's therapy to me because you're hearing the same narrative. And if nothing else, they haven't the, if you, they have a nice blueprint to lead a decent night, a life, you know, you be of service to others. Don't take other people's stuff. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's just kind of like a nice thing. You can we can rewrite it and take all the you know AA references out of it. It's just a little blueprint of how to live a nice life. But you hear that constantly, and you hear people sharing. And uh, I think it's I think it just it was like intense therapy because it's like every single day. And I think that really made I think that that I really think that's the difference. It's oh. like intense therapy and just sitting sitting through the, you know sitting through the pain. Those, those, those situations where uh, it's like, you know, I'm going to drink. I am absolutely 100% going to drink and not, and, and just sitting through that, that urge really. And, and, and it got easier. I remember one time I was like, you know, pretty new and it's like, I was in Orange County. I thought, I, I thought damn, I'm going to get a bottle. I'm going to get, I'm going to go get some alcohol. And I got on my phone. It's like trying to find the nearest liquor store. And it was just a little bit too far away. So I was like, ah, forget it, boom. <laughs> it's because it was just too much razzle. <laughs> wow. But like what you said, that's exactly right. Like getting comfortable with sitting through the tough situations because it's such a knee-jerk reaction just to lean on alcohol, especially when we have for so long. And it just takes those times of like really challenging yourself. Sure, sometimes you might go back to the alcohol, but if you just give yourself the chance to try to cope without it, like you, you grow that muscle and you become better and stronger. Yeah, that's why you, I would sit through it and then, you know, it, it just got easier. It did. It got, it got easier to just not, and then if I thought, of, once I started the Sinclair Method right along, they came at right around the same time, right when I got the new sponsor, the guy that's, you know, I threatened for saving my life. Um, he, uh, I, they came right about within a couple months of each other. I think they, I had already started, got myself firmly back in AA when I uh, was told about the Sinclair Method and also when I went and met Claudia. So, um, it, it, it just, it just worked out that way. And it, it was so beneficial that it happened that way as well, because I think it's just I, I, every day I'm one day and I'm listening to a message that I don't want to hear. You don't want to hear it, but you're there, you know, you're the, why you're there, you know, it's summertime and you're in sweats because you're sweating or withdrawals. I mean, I can't. I can't, I was thinking about that the other day. How many times, you know, how many hundreds of times did you go through withdrawals, withdrawals? And just, and I'd be like, <laughs> I'll call withdrawal day one, day two, day. I'd be Googling it just because next time, you know, even though I, you know, I'd read it all before. I just wanted to know what is I going to feel better here? Um, but uh, no, it's so it was like really intense. And I just think that that, that worked for me. Uh, if people don't do anything for the behavioral side, I don't see how they're ever going to be successful. Because I never think of it, never anything bad happens. I never think, gosh, I need a drink. Now, I might think I'd love a, uh, some pot, some weed, you know, a uh, uh, I wouldn't mind that. But uh, that comes and goes too, because uh, once I start losing my memory more, you, once you get older, you lose your memory a lot more anyway. And you start smoking weed, and it just really takes it to another level. So I've I got to try something else that make, makes, makes you uh, feel happy, joy. 
I don't know. What's I, your life like today? I'm curious. Like, can I you sit, just sit around surrounded by alcohol on the daily basis <laughs> that you don't want? No, I don't want it. I give away. I give it so much of it. It's just so ridiculous. They leave me. I'm in this, I'm in this warehouse and, you know, I'm all alone with millions of dollars worth of alcohol and I don't want any of it. It's like, and I do have access to every single bit of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, it's a. Uh, What's my life without alcohol? I never thought I'd even be able to say this. It's almost so corny, uh, but it's uh, it's just so much better. It is just so much better. I I I wasn't uh, I was a happy drunk until I became an alcoholic, and then I became an isolating, you know, just a, a just a burden on society. I had no value. I had nothing to contribute. I couldn't even take care of myself, you know, and. I, you know, I had to do whatever I had to do to, to live for so long. I mean, I, when I got here, I got Medi-Cal and you know, the SNAP benefits. I was my mother's caregiver and I was trying because I was taking care of her. But she was also one of my biggest triggers and one of the biggest things I had to work through in therapy. There's a lot tied up with that. And she had a, she had a medical dependence on opiates, you know, because she had been in chronic pain. And it was back when they just gave you so much like candy and then she was, you know, so she had that along with all her host of other medical problems. And, but I had, and I had to be her caregiver during all of this too, with her being the biggest thing I needed to work through. <laughs> it was tough. Wow. It just, you know, now it just doesn't feel like it was tough. It doesn't, now it doesn't feel like it was tough because it's, it's so much time has passed that all that, yeah, the, the, the closeness of the memory is, is fading. But, um, it was, I'm, it, it was, it was, Poor. I hate alcohol. The, at the core, I hate alcohol with a passion. I, I, I think I always will for what it took from me. But something in my mind said, you will not win. You will not win. You will not win. And the, somehow this makes me think that, you know, at the end of the day, I said no to the alcohol. And I could. I walked away from it. It gives me a sort of a, bit, a feeling of uh, empowerment. It makes me feel strong. It does. I, I uh, like sitting around alcohol all the time because I, it's even decorating my walls. There's wine everywhere. Let me see if I can show you. <laughs> I mean, like, everywhere you look, there's oh. alcohol. So you're surrounded by alcohol, and you don't even want it. Uh, do you still crave it ever? I, have ne I haven't craved it in so long. I just don't, I don't think about it. So you've been doing it for two years? I did it th three years ago, and I drank on it for one year. And then at about a year, I just kind of got disgusted from alcohol. Like the last few times I drank, it was just like, it kind of made me feel sick. And I was like, this isn't worth it. And so I w went like a month and two months and three months and just was like, okay, I think I'm, I'm done for with, with alcohol. I just didn't want to drink anymore. So you haven't had that, had that actual craving? You no. Know? There's been a few times where like a thought has come into my mind, like if I'm out on a hot day and like an ice cold drink sounds good, but it's not a craving. It's just more like a thought that goes, comes and goes really quickly. But craving, no. There's like, it's more like when I walk <laughs> down the wine aisle, I will gag almost because I'm, I'm disgusted from alcohol. See now, see that now I can think of so many more bad experiences than fun yeah. experiences is with alcohol that it, it helps that helps you know shape your your thinking about it too uh, <clears throat> i just it, it's just no longer something i even think about uh, i just don't even think about it even when i was you know brand newer back in, in the beginning you know you're, you're really just worried about having to tell people that you don't drink they might ask why yeah. you know you don't even say i, I want a coke because you're like oh they're gonna know you know and stupid stuff like, <laughs> like you know nobody really cares you learn all that but then no i don't care anymore you know what most of the people so many people that work nobody that works here knows that i am they don't, they don't know my story yeah. nobody here knows but uh it seems like a lot of people here have a problem with that <laughs> really <laughs> yeah i'm sure you have eyes for it now too what to look for <laughs> He's like, ah, you want okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's so interesting what you said about how nobody even cares if you're not drinking because it's so true. When I was like first starting to drink less on this method, I was like so intimidated to say, oh, I'm not going to drink or no thanks if I didn't want to. And like, now it's, yeah. yeah. Are you an alcoholic? <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't yeah. matter now. <laughs> exactly. You're just like, I just don't want to drink. Yeah. Uh, we just, because that's all we, that's all we thought about. Yeah. 
was when did you get it? It, just, it was always associated with fun times, you know, at the beginning. Yeah. And then bad times and we just want to get those fun times back and we make it worse. And and I got lucky because it is lucky. Uh people the the death rate for alcoholism is still, you know, in AA is only like five percent. I don't, I think the Sinclair, when I started, I'd heard it was like 70 something percent uh, effective or yeah. success rates. I don't know if that's changed because I'm not really up on the new things. Um, and that's because I would be, I think I would be if I had to be. I just had a different experience and now life is just normal and it clicks along without thinking about it. I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel like I have to go to AA every day. I don't, like I said, I haven't been back at all. But um, I just don't, and, and so I don't go. I mean, I mean, I should go back. I just didn't feel like I had any place to be supported anyway, because I'm, none of those people do the Sinclair method, and then I don't do the Sinclair method compliantly. So it's like, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like you, you've overcome it and like had success with it and healed from it truly. So it's like when like people go to therapy for a period of time and when they heal, they don't need to go anymore. And it sounds like that's your experience as well. I need to, you know, I lost, well, so, uh, I ended up getting a therapist um, that had to kind of get me off of my AA guy, you know, so I did have some problems with it. Um, and uh, I, he's good, and but he moved to San Diego, and I haven't gotten around to finding anybody new, and I intend to because I really think that you need somebody who who is, you know, you can just dump all that stuff on. Uh, he, and he, he moved to San Diego. I'm like, well, why can't he do it via Zoom like we're doing right now? So. I'm gonna see if I can just keep him because it's really hard to find somebody. And that's the biggest piece. If you can't find anybody, and if he hadn't crossed my path, I, I don't know what would have happened to me because I, I do hold that side more responsible for my success today than the Sinclair method purely because of how I've grown uh, through the therapy, the cognitive behavior therapy, and addressing these root causes of why I was drinking the way I was drinking or doing all the other stuff. All the, all the silly, risky behaviors and stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice for people to like just keep seeking support. If you're finding, if you're not finding a counselor that's working for you, like keep looking, don't give up. Interview them, find the right one until you don't stop until you do. You get, you got to find someone that you. I mean, I remember going to a counselor and he a was blind, b wanted to pray at the beginning of this. That's like uh, no, you know, it's like I'm not coming here for you know any type of religion. I'm not coming here for for. You know, Anything other than whatever I was going to see with that. I didn't mesh with him. I didn't mesh with a lot of people. I'd pretty much given up. And so I, I, I had, I kept hitting the bottom. I was like, I asked my sponsor, I was like, how long, uh, you know, when's this last bottom get? Gonna get you? <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm done. How much worse can I get? And he's like, when you stop digging, Laura, when you stop digging, that's. Wow. I mean, just, I, I just, that's the way I was doing. I was just digging more, digging more, and digging more. <laughs> So he was very instrumental. But I remember sitting in AA and I was like, I gotta find a sponsor. You gotta find a sponsor. That's what you do. And I gotta find some girl that I gotta call every single day and be accountable to. And I just resented it so much. But I sit there and I, my my brain was soaked back then with alcohol. And the only person I could hear was him. Whenever he shared, uh, he always made sense. And he always was, you know, he, I'd always hear him. But it's like, but of course he was a guy, so I just didn't pay attention to him. Uh, that's against the rules. We even got kicked out of AA because uh, he was my sponsor. We got kicked out of this one room because uh, uh, oh, the drama. These people, well, those people are all dramatic too. Uh, it just, but he was the only voice I heard. And then the, the owner of the room said, oh, Laura, ask Michael then. I said, I can't find anybody. There's this one girl. She kind of makes me nauseous just listening to her story. I was like, I was going to have to ask her. And this woman said, you can ask Michael. He sponsors girls. I'm like, who's Michael? I didn't know, but that was the same guy that I, the only person I could hear, same guy. And so I went up to him after a meeting and he was, okay, A, he's agnostic. So there's no spirituality being taught here. Um, and, you know, he's married. He's a, and he's a guy. So he, he was like, no, no, no. But it, he was, he really took me through it. He really took me through it. And uh, homework and the whole thing. I was just, I talked to, I, I talked and texted with him probably for a solid three years, every day, every day. Or if, if, if it wasn't every day, then I knew 
one time it wasn't a daily, he had been in an accident. I mean, it was every day we would connect on via text or something or see each other. And uh, it was intense, but I needed intense. Yeah. And you just stuck it out. I mean, you kept, you were committed to it. It sounds like. I, yeah, I just, you know, it's no way to live, especially when you look back at it, what we did. Uh, but I was always just so sick and just, just, just nothing. I was just nothing, just waiting to die. I would sit there and think about how I could take my mother out, you know, to take us out together and just sort of wouldn't have to deal with it. I mean, all of that. I think depression and substance abuse, you know, it goes hand in hand. And I think that, uh, you know, I was also trying to find out different types of things for uh, just my luck. I, uh, I used to be really into the, that I used to have to prescribe benzos right, to sleep because, uh, and of course I abused those Xanax and everything uh, for years and years, but they, when they were trying all these different drugs for the depression, I had the exact opposite result. And then, you know, the wanting to kill myself because even though I was in my forties, um, I still had really bad reactions to antidepressants where I'd have suicidal ideation. Just calm. I mean, that's all I could think about. That's all I could think about was just killing myself. And so I found out by doing DNA on my medications that I had a condition that for anti, uh, for those types of medications, they do the exact opposite. I, I have a folate acid conversion issue. Whoa. So, and it, it really, it, it, so they, they give you a list of pills that like, this is okay, group, and this is you know, some side effects, this is stay away from uh, medications. And, you know, my doctor had been systematically trying all these different medications to knock me out of my depression. And you would be depressed too. <laughs> uh, and nothing, nothing worked. They always just made everything worse. So right now, um, nothing. I'm not on anything. Uh, wow. That's such a testament to how much you, like, your story is such a success story and so inspiring on so many levels. I, I wish it was that way for everybody. I mean, I really do. And I, I don't, I don't have those magic words, I guess just never give up because I thought I'd given up, but you know, our, our, our will to live is pretty strong. Um, <laughs> and I don't have kids. See, I didn't have all, you know, the whole thirties time. I was just one of those people just playing and having a great time going on trips traveling, drinking, and drinking, and just traveling just to go drink somewhere else, you know, for a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try drinking in Mexico this week. Exactly. I was going to drink in the Bahamas this week, <laughs> you know, and it was always just about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I love the irony of my, of my story. I just love the irony of it. And uh, I, I did grow closer to... Uh, spirituality through through the process through AA I think that did I never you know I uh I did I've never really been a, a every Sunday go to church type of person uh, organized religion doesn't uh, appeal to me as much so uh, AA be, kind of became my religion even though I thought it, I thought it was cult like and I had all kinds of bad things to say about it, it, it it's got good things too it does I mean and, and it never works I was I was going to try anything I could because I'd already given up and I was so mad, I was so angry that, that a bottle of alcohol could do that to me. Like, how, how could it do that? And all the things that we did, you know, and all the regrets that we had because of it, I had to really learn how to work through all that too in the AA or I wouldn't probably be here and forgive myself or the, the things you do and when you're uh, in the middle of that horrible cycle of uh, thinking. I, 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 no matter how mortifying things got, it still it was never enough to make me stop drinking. Mm -hmm. I literally threw up on a girl in Denver at a work function when I was interviewing to be a vice president of client services for this company, and I got the job. So <laughs> negative repercussions. I never got, well, except for losing everything, he took everything away and said, then maybe like live in like hell for 12 years trying to find my way back. <laughs> but I mean, that's the way it was. And I got back. He let me that part easy once it finally happened. It took a long time. When I say he, I'm just talking about God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. It's it's worth it. I you know, here's one thing. This is very important too. You have to respect the disease. Okay. I don't if you alcohol use disorder, I'm just not used to saying that. I know that's our new ling lingo. I say alcoholic just because everybody, but it is a disease. And but you and and the fact that it is a disease 
no matter how easy it was for me, I respect that disease. I respect it so much. And if I ever thought any time that I've drank in these last six years, that it felt even a little bit uh, for the wrong reasons or something, I, th I think I, I have naltrexone on me. I ha always have it. I, if I ever felt like I needed a drink, that's when I say I can, you can't have a drink because you don't need a drink. No. <laughs> you want, you know, and it just doesn't happen for me anymore. But I, I, I respect it for what it did and how strong and how powerful it is. It has, it, it has destroyed, you know, millions of people's lives. And that, that never leaves me, my mind either. I, I respect it. And if I think if I felt just a little bit like I was going for that drunk, I wouldn't probably, I'd probably be too scared to drink because I, I can't do it again. You know, you think what you went through, how you lived. I don't think, you know, you get older and you can't, I can't, I don't think I can do that again. But uh, it was the most miserable, miserable thing ever for years and years and years of misery. And uh, that's why I keep respecting the disease as my litany. It's just always know, remember what it did to you and don't even get, give it a chance. So that's why I still carry naltrexone no matter what. It's, I don't know, it's probably, it's probably expired, it's probably expired. <laughs> but uh, my doctor, you know, she would just give it to me. Um, some people have trouble getting it prescribed, right? And uh, you have to go online. My doctor gave it to me, even though I didn't tell her I was doing the Sinclair method, I had to make up something. I was on, because I was on Medi Medi. Um, I told her that when I, when I, I made her think that I took it when I was afraid I was going to crave alcohol, which wasn't a true story because I'm like, I, I don't, I don't crave alcohol. Uh, I just knew I had to have it if I was supposed to drink it. I, you know, I, I tried and it just, if I had to take it before I drank, I, I would never even bother trying another thing. Probably. If I had to, if I was like, forced, you have to take this pill. Yeah, I never, no. To get it, but uh, I, I have always had to think about taking pills either, too, so that doesn't help. I, I just hate taking pills, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know, I just like I every mean, I have to take these things for my joints about some osteo stuff, you know, because my knees are hurting, and it's so like I have to take this pill every day. <laughs> That's so funny, <laughs> I don't know, that was what I thought. That's my own eccentricity, but no, it was, it was, uh. The, the TSM part was the easiest part. The, the, the behavioral side is so much more complicated. And that's where you got to find the good thing. I, 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 uh, and I don't think I'm done. I don't think I'm done. I don't think any of us are ever done, really. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot I can do to be a better person and, and, and still improve. But I'm, I'm getting there. And I, I guess asking for help, you know, is the hardest thing. But it's also the best thing you can ever do. Yeah. And a lot of people, but see, I, I see some people, they're just, they're just thinking that that pill's going to stop the drinking and stopping the drinking is all they need to do to be better. You know, yeah. their, wives, their boyfriends, their, you know, whatever people are just assuming if I take that alcohol equation, I'm okay. I'm okay. And everybody's going to be happy. And that's not going to happen. Yeah. So it's, it's really important to get the therapy along with it. And some people hate AA. Don't go to AA. I hate AA too, but <laughs> um, find something else. There's uh, there's a like a one meeting I'd go to it's called Free Thinkers. Uh, it doesn't follow the, the 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 blue book, the big book, the big book. It doesn't. It's more like for people. Right? It's more for people who entertain other ideas. Yeah. They're smart. They're smart therapy. Smart recovery as well, and a couple of others. But, so uh, they say take from what, what you need and leave the rest. That's kind of how I approach AA. I'd go in there for that hour of conditioning. And yeah. it conditioned me. It worked. I love that so, you said this part of your story, like you had, you'd given up already on yourself, but yet you like still were, were trying. It was just like really beautiful, like how defeated you were, but like you I, still I was were trying. I never thought I'd be here. I still almost wake up on a daily saying, I was like, how, you know, is this real? How did this happen? But I just, I guess it's not, you know, in your nature to just, I tried to roll over and die and I just couldn't die. The reason I was living, but I wouldn't die. So, um, you know, just keep going and, and found the right way. They say, you know, a lot of, most alcoholics are uh, very intelligent people, you know, 
and we, we're, we're that's kind of worse against us too, you know. Yeah. Try to quiet the mind. <laughs> that's still a problem, you know. <laughs> I, that is forever. Do you have any, what's your like last words of advice for people who, whether they're on the Sinclair method, I know you've already given tips around, you know, it's not just the pill and really addressing the behavior side, but you know, what are your kind of last words for people who are struggling right now with alcohol? Therapy. I, 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 I'll say it until I'm blue in the face. You know, the Sinclair method would never work for me if I wasn't getting the cognitive behavior ther therapy as well. It really, it, it just took across the mental. And I don't like having to do things I don't like to do. So I just stick with that. Just start letting your, letting, letting your mind accept the possibility that alcohol is uh, not your friend. <laughs> and, and to just distance, time and distance away from it. But get the therapy and, and get with those issues that made you want to drink. And so far for some people, especially men, they don't want to go see a therapist. And so I don't know how they're going to ever do it successfully because they're just, they're not addressing the problem, but you've got to talk to somebody who can understand. It has to be somebody that maybe understands addiction because if they don't even, if they don't understand addiction or alcoholism or anything, you know, substance abuse, they're never going to be able to relate to you and you're never going to be able to relate to them. But you got to, so you got to find somebody that you can talk to and, for me, that was the best way to do it was just the AA, that meeting's there every single day at the same time. That's your medicine. Just go take, that's, go take your medicine there and, and come back. But if I had just sat there instead of working with Michael, then I wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't have been successful either. So you just have to find somebody. You just have to keep trying. You have to find that person who can listen to you and that you can respect hearing the words come back because you're going to hear some hard words come back, you know? So you know, it's really painful. The painful side, now the, the physical side is very painful. Don't get me wrong. But the mental side is extremely painful to go through. And, and that's the only part that, that will let you have a life without alcohol, without it bothering you. I didn't want to take a pill every single day for the rest of my life, just in case I had a drink. Yeah. And I would have been drinking. So I don't know, you know, depression, just, 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 I don't, I, I don't know, because I felt like I gave up. I don't know what to tell you, Katie. I, said, I did give up, you know. I, I thought I, gave up. I pretty much gave up. And, and uh, well, I was just going through the motions of having to go to a meeting just to be able to have a roof over my head that night so I could have a place to sleep. So I had to go to the meeting, so, you know, because I was going to be told on if I didn't. Here I am in my 40s, you know, been living in an alcoholic blur for years and years. Now I'm like, I got to go because I'm going to tell on me if I don't go. My mom will I'll be in trouble, you know. And so I had to go. But it worked. And so, if I, you know, I wish I could have said I, I made myself go every day. But I did. Somebody else actually held my feet to the fire. And, but it took that for me. And, and some people might take that. Then you hear the people, other people have the, the really easy experiences of stopping drinking. And I resent that. Just like, <laughs> just like people probably resent me now because I had a, a, a quick response to the Maltrex sound. But no, my only advice is the Maltrex sounds good stuff. I love it. I love the fact that it does block those receptors and, and seems to have done what it's touted to do in my case. But um, it's, uh, don't, don't, didn't you, don't you feel, doesn't everybody kind of feel bad on it? I mean, doesn't it just do that for everybody? I never had any support. I've never been in anybody's support group about TSM, so I don't really know a lot about it. I just know that it definitely cut out my pleasure receptors to alcohol. And uh, the nausea is the only thing I really remember. But, but didn't it always just, when I took it, I just always felt, especially the next day, the next day, the next morning when you wake up, it was like, I always felt down. Yeah, and I think, you know, everyone responds to it differently. And for some people, I've known people who've had to take it every single day and they start to experience that. But for others, like, because the Sinclair method isn't necessarily taking it every day, it gives it time to flush out of the system, but it, it can make people feel blue and for me well, I want to take it every day because it's an opioid blocker so if yeah you get an accident and you yeah you're gonna be just like suffering um and that's not it's not good for you but uh i would never want to take it every day it's just it, everything about it i mean i love i love that it's able to do something that hopefully helps tons of people with this with this terrible disease but i love that part about it because i want there to be a cure for alcoholism i want there to be a cure for alcoholism and i say there is a cure for alcoholism and 
I, most people, no one believes me, but I say it, and I try to say why. Um, and maybe, maybe in another fifty years, it'll be widely accepted. Maybe it won't even take that long. Who knows anymore? But people, you know, it's, I get so I get so angry. I mean, it's like oh. Today, science hasn't come up with anything. It's like, well, this book was written 100 years ago. Hello. Can somebody come on and update the book? Is there something? They don't want to hear it. They never want to hear it. That's what they, that's their bread and butter. They get, they make their money because people can't put their teeth. And, uh, you know, so they don't want to tell. It's like, there it is. They just don't want to hear it. And medical advances can make, maybe hopefully in the future, you could just take, you know, one pill one time, boom, back to normalcy. Maybe. <laughs> Build yourself back up. I wish we could do that for all the problems we have in our head. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's pretty miraculous. And for me, you know, it's like the benefits of it are, I, yeah, I mean, to get me away from alcohol, that was just like a miracle how the pill worked. It was amazing. Does it feel like it gives you some sort of security because you have some sort of weapon to use against Yeah, and it was so exciting, honestly. Like, for a while on the method, I, I felt so great. I loved it because it, it, I felt empowered around alcohol. I didn't binge anymore. I could go out and have drinks like a normal person, and that was awesome. But then the less and less I drank, the longer I was on it, I just, like, loved. I fell out of love with alcohol completely. And I guess that's the purpose of the method. It, that's what extinction gets. That's me. what it does. So when I, when you say re reach extinction, I said, you know, I just, I just, I got tired of getting feeling sick at every single night. I was trying, I was trying to do like five times a week. That's way too much. But uh, I just got to the point where I just couldn't bear the thought of taking another pill and drinking. And I got to the point where, um, I wasn't, I done, I was done. Like this isn't, if this isn't, is it normal? See, then I'm never going to be normal. So it probably wasn't. But uh, it just, it just stopped. And then I, I'd go on some trips. And when I realized that I, I realized that almost like I'd had the exact same reaction, no matter if I took a pill or not. I, I went on a, cause I, a couple of times, like, okay, here you go. There you go. I'm non compliant. And every time I did it, nothing happens. Like, yeah, but you hear what they say, you, you know, it's going to happen to you. You're going to get slippery slope. It's like, but it didn't. Every time I went to drink, I'd still have the same exact feeling, even though I didn't take the pill. And I would be like, and then I, I'm this weirdest person, I'd take a drink and I would hold it in my mouth for like five minutes. I just wouldn't forget, I wouldn't swallow it. <laughs> what? I don't know. Why. That's so funny. I finally just gave up on it. I just did. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And like you said, too, I mean, you've obviously done a lot of work on yourself and it's like you're the first person I've heard of where you reached extinction and kind of stayed there and don't need the naltrexone. So I'm I'm excited to be getting this truth out there and because I don't want to be dogmatic, even though, you know, it's like that that is like the golden rule is like be on it for the rest of your life. But I, I want to get your story out there because you are an example. I think learn behavior. I think you can, you know, your, your, your brain's going to tell you. This is the way you, you've learned, you've trained yourself to think this way. It's going to happen. Um, it's not, but it's so truly, I, I don't know that it's, I think it's in my head. I think it's just the way I've, I've done it, you know? Yeah. And, and you can, everybody can, can do that. Just, it doesn't happen overnight. And we're all very patient people, you know, instant gratification is the way we want everything. So it isn't going to happen like that. And, um, but it, it, it could happen. It's just, that's the amazing thing is that, because from, from where you just can't, the only thing that's important is alcohol to where I, you, I go days and days and days and weeks and weeks and years and whatever. And I don't even think about it. I never thought I could be like that. I never thought I could be like that. I thought I'd always be thinking about, even if I wasn't actively drinking, I'd be a lot more actively talking about my life the way it was, you know, like, and that isn't even there. Just, it just does it's like, just not, it's just nothing. Just yeah. Nothing. And I, I, I wish everybody had the exact same experience I did, but. Well, I, I think, think you're, you give good right. advice based on your experience. Yeah. To not give up and seek, seek support, like be engaged. It sounds like in the process, like, you know, just, yeah. You know, yeah. Don't look at, don't look at the Sinclair method as being just going to, you're going to take pills and you're going to get extinction and you're going to be normal. That's, that's, that's a really bad avenue to think down. And I think a lot of people think that though. They don't want to go to the AA. They don't want to do the therapy. Yeah, and if that wasn't a part of my equation, I wouldn't be successful. Maybe other people can do that, but my behaviors had to change. My thoughts had to change. Yeah, and I had to uh, go through some really uncomfortable realizations and recognize what I did and what I what I had to own. You know? Yeah. 
Because if you don't, even if you are having success with the pill alone and then you get more sober, I've seen people kind of get scared of like, oh my gosh, like I, I don't like this sobriety because there's so much discomfort that you have to deal with that they'll just stop doing the method and go back to their old ways because it, it, you've been numbed for so long. I know for me, I was numbed out oh, yeah. for 10 years. Oh, that's the worst time. Yeah, you feel stuff again and you're just like, oh gosh, what is this? And that feeling, that sucked. That, you don't do that from the, <laughs> that's the stuff that's hard to work through those feelings, you know, that, that. <laughs> those were horrible. But, uh, but you do, I mean, you, you get out on the other side. That's the only way you're going to get there. Uh, I thought I was hopeless. So I am, um, I am an example that you should never give up because I really thought I had, I was just drifting along. I couldn't get it just until, until it was over. I didn't know what to do with it. I couldn't even get a job at like a fast food restaurant. I, didn't wow. get a job. I thought, okay, this is it. I was going to try to exist, you know, get enough to live for today and I'll try again tomorrow. And I got, who wants to live a life like that? So I'll, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story so openly. Is there, is there anything more you want to share before we hang up? Yeah, probably. I'll probably think about 20,000 new things I wanted to say. Um, but I would like to say that if anybody would like to talk to me about my experience, uh, anybody can call me uh, or text me or email me. I'm happy. I'm happy to engage. It does help keep us uh, where we are successful. Um, and uh, so, you know, feel free to give that information if anybody would like to talk to me. I would uh, be happy to answer anybody's questions about my experience and any tips, but uh, it's always going to be therapy first and it's got to be find somebody you can talk to, not just somebody who's a therapist. Yeah, I will. But, Thank you. you. Know and if you don't hate AA, just do that. It's free and it's every day at the same time. You don't have to talk. You don't have to tell me anything. You just need to listen to, listen, be on the floor, be in that room and just listen to other people's stories because you'll get, you'll get, you'll get it through that. Yeah. And, and, and working with a sponsor. I mean, he made me, he didn't want, he didn't want all my resentments, but he he had to take that inventory. I mean, that whole, but that's the only thing I really did was that fourth and fifth step. And that in and of itself is what really mattered. The fourth step is when you're writing down all your, you know, your shit for everybody you can't stand and why. And then the fifth one where you're telling somebody, but you're also owning your side of it. And that's when you really came to understand the things that need to change and got all that poison out of me. So the two. All the poison's out, and I'm pseudo normal. <laughs> as normal as we can be. <laughs> so definitely, I would love to talk to anybody if they have any questions. Uh, just don't give up. Do be compliant. I, 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 I wish I was. I wish like I could say I was a, just a, a perfect role model, but I'm not. And and I don't think that I have to. Uh, but if I ever thought I did, I will never get close to where we were at one point because we know better now. Yeah. We know <laughs> There's a second I ever thought I'd want a drink. Like I said, it would freak me out so much. It would yeah. really, freak me out. I don't want those feelings anymore. And I haven't had that. And I have not had a drunk. It's not the video. When I got a little tipsy, it was kind of fun. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I was a party. And I was like, oh, that was, I was always a happy drunk. And I started feeling happy. And it's like, and then I just started to think about it that way. It made me come right back down. Like, yeah, play, play it out. Play it out. Play that tape out of what, what's going to happen if you keep. If you take another drink without, you know, being compliant or. Yes. Because so, life is too sweet on the other side. Like it's, it's, yeah. Once you get a taste of what life can be like without an addiction to alcohol, it's just, you can't even compare it. Uh, I, I still, I'm still, you know, here I'm 40 years smoking, you know, and you do, you do know this, and this is one of the whatever, it, you're going to take that addic- addictive behavior somewhere else. And you have. Every one of us, we don't, I don't, it doesn't go away. It just, it rechannels. It's like getting lipo the fact it goes to other places. It can never go back to the same place. It's the same thing. You know, you, uh, you, my, I have an addictive personality. I still smoke. I still gamble. I mean, I hit the jackpot the other night, but, you know, the time before I, I put 4,000 in in 20 minutes, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Right. Uh, now he's like, no, we, we switched it. And I still have very addictive behavior. I don't know how to stop any of that. I'm not in therapy for doing that. I haven't really, it's not impacting my life really. It's not making it, you know, really horrible. It's not controlling like your life. Yeah. And I can function through it. But no, I, I, I still have those type of behaviors, whether it be, you know, I go into a store just to run in and get something, I'll end up shopping. 
I hate shopping, but I'll end up shopping and I'll end up buying. That's my problem. The quarantine, I was like laying in bed. I was like, I'm gonna buy a red, I'm gonna buy a red bolt. I bought a red bolt. <laughs> you know, it's just what is your bolt? Oh, a car. A, car. a bolt. <laughs> Impulse purchase. I was like, you know, I, just, I, I have, I have very, I don't know if you're like this, but I have very poor imp impulse control still. Very poor impulse control. I just, I don't know, I could get grab it and go. I still, have, well, I still have some really bad behaviors, but at least uh, they're, not, they're not like they were. Yeah. I just think about, you know, going on calls. I, I don't really know all the horrible things that may have went on during my reign of terror, you know, since I was doing what I just told you told about a little earlier. It's like, that's scary. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. The, the one thing, though, the last thing is just forgive yourself. Forgive mm -hmm. yourself. You're not getting anywhere if you can't forgive yourself either. Because you, you got you to gotta work on just loving this person that's been so abused. Yes. And then that's the forgive yourself. Find a therapist. Take your pill, naltrexone. Don't take it daily if you, unless you're a daily drinker. Um, well, that's kind of stupid. I, mean, I can't imagine being an alcoholic and not being a daily drinker. Who's an alcoholic that's not a daily drinker? I couldn't relate to that, you know, but, but they are. You, you should be doing it on the weekends. You can be doing it twice a year. It's not a problem, you know, so they've proven all of that. Um, but I would hate to take it. I feel every day. And uh, just and, and, and put celebrate little victories, you know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you celebrate along, along the way, it just, it, it, at least you're acknowledging the effort that you're putting into it. Cause it took, and, and I guess it took all of my effort. I don't, yeah, I wasn't working. I don't know if that, you know, I could have done anything but work up, worked on myself through, you know, AA. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't capable of functioning like a normal person. I, I just wasn't. And so I felt good. I didn't lose, I didn't lose a uh, family, you know, like family relationships. I didn't have any. I'm single. I'm single. You know? And I didn't have kids. And I just hit it so well from my family. They just had no clue. That's why my dad thought was, she must be crazy. I'm going to put her on a psych ward. And I did. And it was off psych ward. were no fun. They are not fun like rehab. They were not fun at all. <laughs> they are zero fun. <laughs> They're not fun like we <laughs> And there were some really crazy people and they're like, okay, that person's really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean there were some crazy, crazy people. I don't want to I don't want to stay here. No, this is not fun at all. Oh, it's awful. It was like the ones who overcooked this now. It was awful. It was awful. Oh my goodness. It's not fun. Not fun. And no. Well, I really want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an amazing uh, experience talking with you and hearing your story. And I appreciate you being so open and honest. And yeah, just thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for asking. I mean, thank you so much. I, I, uh, I like talking about it. I don't talk about it ever. So I'm sorry if I was a little all over the board, but that's the way I always am anyway. No, it's great. You, it all connected the dots. <laughs> I loved it, actually. It was, yeah, your story is very fascinating and just diverse and so yeah. relatable I think for a lot of people and your advice like your lived experience and the advice you've given it's it's really helpful mm -hmm.